Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished members of the audience, on behalf of the Public Affairs Center, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the launch of the Public Affairs Index 2022. I am particularly enthused by today's event and its in-person nature. Today marks a fortunate departure from two years of COVID interruption. The Public Affairs Index, a five as we call it, is of significant importance to us. Not only is this flagship report at the center of PAC's annual calendar, it is of objective value to policy makers, scholars, practitioners, and fellow change makers alike. Recognizing states as platforms for development action, PI is a conscious effort to measure the quality of governance across India. The seventh edition of PI coincides with 75 years of independent India's journey. Celebrating this journey, PI 22 returns to one of the first documented ideas of India, its constitution. Against this backdrop, I invite guests for today's evening. Mr. V. Sudhish Pai, Dr. A. Ravindra, and Mr. G. Guruchalan to occupy the distinguished chairs on the stage. I take great honor in welcoming to the diet our chief guest this evening, Mr. V. Sudhish Pai. Mr. V. Sudhish Pai, Senior Advocate High Court of Karnataka, is a distinguished jurist and a critically acclaimed author. Having been at the bar for nearly four decades, his expertise lies in constitutional law and administrative law. On account of his accomplishments, which there are many, and his academic profoundness, Mr. Pai is often cited as a legal philosopher. Between 1999 and 2006, Mr. Pai was government advocate at the High Court of Karnataka, during which time he handled sensitive litigation on behalf of the state. He was a visiting chair professor, Ashutosh Mukherjee chair in NUJS Kolkata, and is a resource person at the National Judicial Academy, Bhopal, uh, where he oversees the continuing legal education for serving judges. I'm also pleased to have in our midst Dr. A. Ravindra, chairman CAP. Dr. A. Ravindra joined the Indian Administrative Service in 1965 and has since served in various capacities retiring as Chief Secretary to the Government of Karnataka. Dr. A. Ravindra holds a PhD in Development Studies and has specialized in the urban sector. I'm also pleased to introduce our Director, Mr. G. Guruchalan. Uh, Mr. G. Guruchalan, in his uh, career of 38 years, has occupied several important positions in the higher echelons of government, retiring as Secretary to the Government of India in 2016. At PAC, he is the chief functionary and he provides strategic direction at the center in partnering with government, corporate, and civil society organizations. May I please request Mr. Guru Charan, Director PAC, to address the gathering with his opening remarks. Uh, very good evening to all of you uh, and a very warm welcome. Uh, let me at the outset welcome uh, the chief guest of uh, today's function, Mr. Sudish Pai. Thank you very much, Mr. Pai, being with us. Uh, he holds a special place uh, uh, in the scheme of things today because uh, besides being a very distinguished lawyer, uh, he specializes in uh, constitutional law. And uh, one of the dominant themes of uh, the Public Affairs Index 2022 is uh, the basis that the Constitution provides for uh, development action by the states. I also want to welcome uh, Dr. A. Ravindra, uh, Chairman of the Public Affairs Center, who has uh, been uh, a guiding force uh, in this journey of the Public Affairs Index 2022. Uh, like uh, Nidhi said, we are all very enthused uh, today uh, because it's after a long gap of two years that we're actually having a face-to-face -face meeting and the launch of the seventh edition of the Public Affairs Index. The last two years, we had to do a virtual launch because of COVID-19. And uh, I'm also enthused by the very distinguished gathering that uh, has come together this evening. Uh, I want to acknowledge at the outset, uh, some of the very senior people who were uh, important 
public policy practitioners who are present today. Uh, I would begin with uh, acknowledging the presence of uh, Dr. S. Ramanathan, 1952 batch of the IAS. He retired as secretary to the government of India. He has been, uh, he, he, he served as chairman of the Indian Institute of Public Administration, Karnataka chapter for almost 30 years, been a model uh, civil servant and uh, uh, a beacon of uh, guidance for younger officers. I also want to acknowledge uh, Dr. S. Srinivasan, uh, former Defense Secretary, Government of India from the 1954 batch. Uh, Mr. Ramnathan is uh, 94 and uh, Dr. Srinivasan is 92. And it gives us that much more energy that uh, they are here uh, evincing keen interest in uh, public policy. So thank you, sirs, both of you for being here. I also want to acknowledge the presence of Mr. B.K. Das, former Chief Secretary, Government of Karnataka. He was uh, in one important assignment uh, in which I was Secretary Budget and Resources in Karnataka, my boss. And uh, looking back, perhaps one of the best bosses that I've had. Thank you for coming, sir. Uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Vijay Baskar, former Chief Secretary, Government of Karnataka. And, uh, very distinguished uh, career. He is now the chairman of the uh, administrative, second administrative reforms commission. And I must say uh, to his credit that uh, it's been probably the fastest pace at which uh, a commission has worked because uh, he's already submitted third three reports and uh, just telling me that the fourth is due to be released uh, uh, shortly. Uh, I'm also happy that uh, Mr. Basavraju is here state uh, uh, chief election commissioner. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, we have uh, distinguished academics in our midst today. Uh, we have Dr. Jeevan Kumar, a former professor of Bangalore University and now uh, professor with uh, Gadag uh, University, Rural Development University, Gadag. Thank you, Dr. Jeevan for uh, joining us this evening. I want to acknowledge the presence of Mr. Meenakshi Sundaram, uh, also once my boss, and uh, who gave me very good advice when he was Secretary of Rural Development and I was Deputy Secretary uh, just before I went to the district. Thank you, sir, for uh, being with us today. Uh, we have uh, Mr. GMP Reddy, former DG of Police uh, West Bengal with us. Thank you for coming. We have uh, Mr. Gopal Hosur, uh, very distinguished police officer from Karnataka, uh, who's also here. Where, where is he sitting? Uh, there you are, Gopal. So welcome, uh, Gopal. Uh, uh, I must not miss uh, Sita Shekhar, uh, you know, former senior uh, employee of uh, Public Affairs Center. She she was uh, uh, also ED of uh, Public Affairs Foundation, and not uh, last but not the least. Professor Rituparna Sen from the Indian Statistical Institute, who did uh, a lot of work to help us make uh, PI 2022 much more scientific and rigorous. Uh, for those of you who are uh, not too familiar with uh, the Public Affairs Center, uh, there might be very few who are not, but nonetheless, uh, and to sort of uh, keep uh, the chief guest uh, uh, informed about who we are and what we do. Uh, the Public Affairs Center is a not-for-profit think tank dedicated to improving the quality of public governance in India. We are 28 years old and uh, we are best recognized for our social accountability practice. Uh, I must uh, mention that Dr. Samuel Paul, who started the Public Affairs Center, pioneered uh, the citizen report card. In fact, he invented it, shall we say. And uh, in 2004, uh, 10 years after PAC was formed, uh, the World Bank recognized the CRC as uh, a very powerful transformative tool to make the lives of the poor better. Uh, we are now focused primarily at the sub-national level, working with partnering state governments, and our focus is development sectors, education, health, 
uh, women and child development, nutrition, and so on. Uh, tw the 28 year journey has positioned public in a very niche, unique place. They perhaps the only institution of its kind in the that combines uh, domain action research and uh, the application of data science to public governance. Uh, not many of you might know that in 2017, we established uh, a vertical within the Public Affairs Center called the Center for Open Data Research, which is dedicated to the application of data science, public governance. And uh, when Mr. Vijay Bhaskar was Chief Secretary, we actually concluded a knowledge partnership with the government of uh, Karnataka to help apply data science in uh, some of the key uh, departments. So in the past 28 years, PAC has carved a niche for itself for integrity, transparency, and public good. Uh, PAC has earned the trust of the public and the governments alike. And this is the legacy that we seek to fiercely protect and build upon. Let me say a few words about the Public Affairs Index 2022. Uh, first of all, it's the seventh edition of the index. Uh, the first one having been launched in 2017. Uh, if there's just one feature of the Public Affairs Index 2022 that I might highlight, it is that the model that the PAC has developed, generates the values, the weights, and the ranks, thus eliminating all subjectivity. Add to this the fact that it draws entirely on official data from the government of India, removes any speculation on the choice of data sets, thus making the ranking of states in India a very objective assessment. The PI 2022 that we are releasing today seeks to demonstrate two important empirical facts. First, that the quality of governance shapes development outcomes in substantive ways. Second, that human development by its intrinsic quality rests on the idea of justice, social, economic, and political. The organic unit of this trinity, as you will see, is at the heart of the findings of the Public Affairs Index 2022. Uh, we made a paradigm shift this year in the Public Affairs Index. From 2019, for three years consecutively, we had adopted the Sustainable Development Goals framework uh, of growth, equity, and sustainability as the pillars uh, for uh, the framework for the Public Affairs Index. This year, we thought having completed 75 years of freedom is an important milestone in our country's history. And as a country, India has much to be proud of. In great measure, the success that we have achieved, the progress that we have made, has been possible because of the vision for action contained in the Constitution of India. I will not dwell too much on this because my colleague, uh, who leads the PI team will be making a presentation on this. Suffice to say that while we have achieved a great deal, much remains to be done. The fundamental challenge staring us in the face, I think, is the growing inequality in uh, different regions of the country. Against this background, the objective of the Public Affairs Index 2022 is twofold. First, we try to show why public policy at the state level must focus primarily on human development, that is education, health, and livelihoods, and why it matters in our endeavor towards a just society. The re recommendations that flow from the Public Affairs Index 2022 serve as useful pointers for policy interventions that are geography specific for the states of India. Second, the Public Affairs Index 2022 investigates what explains the divergent trends in inequality and development across the states of India, with a particular focus 
on its impact on the disadvantaged and vulnerable populations. Finally, Public Affairs Index 2022 provides individual state fact sheets that contain recommendations for interventions that are context specific and resource sensitive. So let me conclude by asking the question, what work does the Public Affairs Index 2022 do? In practice, in terms of the action that it might help direct, what it does is it will, all of us know that states function in resource constrained environments. There are conflicting demands on resources, whether or uh, human resources. And therefore, the state fact sheets and the analysis of Public Affairs Index 2022 enable states to what I would describe as uh, the ability to prioritize expenditure, to optimize solutions, and to engage in community, uh, engage the community to participate in the development process such that we, uh, from a supply driven development paradigm, we move towards a demand driven uh, development paradigm. Uh, so therefore, Public Affairs Center uh, presents to all of you the Public Affairs Index 2022 with uh, a deep sense of epistemic humility in the hope that uh, what is contained as the findings and recommendations of this uh, report will help the states to perform better in the forthcoming years. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, sir, for your cogent reflection on the challenges staring governments uh, regarding development. Thank you also for contextualizing Pi 22 and how it measures governance. With this, we approach the heart of the event. At this point, perhaps the guests on stage could take their seats in the front row. I'm glad to invite my colleague, Ms. Anjana Kheer Paratil, team lead Pi 22, to walk the members of the audience through the report's underpinnings, methodology, and findings. Over to you, Anjana. Seventy-five years ago, when the clock struck 12 on 15th August, chiming with Nehru's speech, Trist with Destiny, we forgot that the most important and daunting task at that time was to write a constitution. The country was rampant with poverty, high rates of illiteracy, rampant malnutrition, amidst the myriad of other issues, social, cultural, and economic, that was challenging India. Despite all, we had a constitution that was adopted on 26 November 1949 in the Constituent Assembly and brought into force on 26 January 1950. The articulate account of the fundamental rights, the directive principles of state policy, and the clear demarcation of responsibilities between the state and the central governments is continues to hold relevance today in the legal and governance discourse. Indian constitution is still a living document, pulsating with over 105 amendments made to it. Therefore, the most apparent yardstick to measure governance had to be the constitution. Public Affairs Index, therefore, analyzes the states on their basis of endeavor of the states in realizing this constitutional mandate. The spirit of justice invoked in the preamble to the constitution can be interpreted as the guiding principle for all the elements of the constitution. Therefore, PI 2022 places critical importance on justice, social, economic, and political as the lens of governance analysis in India. As Kafka's parable goes, the team now found ourselves standing before the law the new mountainous task was to quantify something that Austin Granville called the cornerstone of the nation. How do you quantify the constitution? In our first ideation meeting, Mr. Gurucharan, the director, told me, quoting Adam Smith, that parsimony is a virtue, and Anjana, you have to pursue it. When we started PI in 2016, we had over 100 indicators, which was brought down to around 50 in the previous three versions. Today, we have 22 indicators, 
And the rationale for identifying these 22 indicators was to go by a first principle basis. While recognizing that governance is at the intersection of processes, institutions, and outcomes, PI adopts a purely outcome-based selection of indicators. For example, a state may have 100 hospitals, 2,000 beds, 50 testing centers, and a brilliant uh, supply chain management. All of these would result in reduced deaths and reduced disease burdens. So in PI, we only look at those reduced deaths and reduced disease burdens. The items in the state list, the transferred items in the con uh, concurrent list, and the directive principles of state policy were scrutinized by the team carefully over a long period of time through the lens of social, economic, and political justice to arrive at the key outcome-based indicators. In PI 2022, we have three themes, five sub-themes, and 22 indicators. The first theme that we look at is economic justice, which has two sub-themes, that is revenues of state and social security and social insurance. The second theme that we analyzed was political justice and with the lens of rule of law. And the third theme is social justice, which we looked at through the lens of social sec securing social order of promotion of welfare and the control of material resources. Now I'll move on to the methodology that we've used in PI 2022, which also sees a paradigmatic shift. Until the previous years, we used the principal component analysis, and this time with the help of Professor Rituparna, we were able to identify the multi-criteria decision-making model. The MCDM is usually used in businesses to identify the best alternative. When you have three to four different things to choose from, and five to six different ideas within those themes, we use multi-criteria decision-making approach. In PI 2022, we use multi-criteria decision through the technique for order of preference by similarity to ideal solution, which is TOPSIS. So essentially what we do is we don't give a weight to the indicator. We measure how far away from the worst performing state and how close to the best performing state that particular value is. So we don't need to say, oh, this is important, let's give it a 20% importance, or this is important, let's give it a 30% importance. What we see is the best performing state becomes the benchmark, and you have to be really far away from the worst performing state to get the best rank. We also use the uh, mahal Dobbs distance to identify from the 22 indicators to reduce the dimensionality and bring it to one point so that it's comparable between states. In addition to eliminating assignment of weights to indicators, using the mahal nobis distance also takes into account the covariance between the indicators, thus substantially reducing the pre-processing required for data sets. Now let's go into how we've divided states in PI 2022. Using the population, now you cannot compare a state like Uttar Pradesh with a state like Goa. We've analyzed 28 different states in India and bifurcated them on the basis of population into 18 large and 10 small states. While the previous year looked at union territories, this time we've kept it aside because when we're analyzing it through the lens of the constitution, it becomes difficult to uniformly assign importance for the union territories and the states. Say for example, we also considered uh, retaining only those union territories with a legislative assembly. However, if you take the case of Delhi, and an indicator like crime. Police in Delhi is controlled by the central government, the home department under the government of India. So it did not make sense to attribute their failures or successes to the Delhi government. And therefore we've kept aside the union territories this year. I shall now try and briefly provide insights thematically for the three themes, economic, political, and social justice. The first one would be economic justice, equities and inequities. Economic distribution and redistribution is a recurrent theme in the discourse of justice. Directive principles of state policy and all the other parts of the constitution provide obligatory attention to equitable distribution of resources, making available equal opportunities to different communities and the freedom from the slavery of economic necessity. A country's economic progression can be analyzed through economic growth as well as economic development. What economic growth could be measured in the terms of GSDP? Is there a growth in GSDP? Yes. So there is economic growth. 
Economic development, however, looks at the quality of life and the inherent economic well-being of the community that should have ideally happened if there is a growth in GDP. We take care of both those aspects. Since governments are in a constant endeavor to balance and prioritize their multitudinous, multitudinous responsibilities, economic stability is what gives them the autonomy to do whatever they want to do. Bearing the fundamental responsibility for economic development, PI 2022 analyzes the revenues of state through three indicators. Public expenditure on development. That is, what percentage of the GDP does a state government spend in improving development? The second indicator was labor productivity. We measured it in terms of gross state domestic product per hour. Per hour of what a person com contributes to the economy, what is the productivity coming out of it? And the third indicator is own source revenue mobilization. If the gross state domestic product is taken as the pool available for the state, what percentage of it does the state avail as their own revenue? The second aspect of uh, economic justice is social security and social insurance. We look at it through five different indicators, unemployment rate, gender contrasted worker population ratio. So we see the difference between the male and the female worker population ratio. We look at the standard of living of Mandega workers, because if you look at the state, state intervention in terms of wages comes when unemployment through Mandega is looked at. So we look at the difference between the Mandega wage notified by the state and the state notified state poverty line. How far away is a Mandega wage worker able to live with the income he gets from the state notified scheme? We look at Gini index, which measures economic inequality. And we also look at the proportion of population covered by social safety nets. This map outlines the broad uh, top performers and bottom performers. So Karnataka and Maharashtra, interestingly, they come, uh, they have the fourth and the fifth highest uh, per capita net domestic product, respectively. But they recorded high inequality of distribution in the states. Now, this could be a function of high slum population in Maharashtra, in a state like Maharashtra. But what is important to note here is that there is also a high urban-rural divide. If your growth wasn't con concentrated in one single point, you, would you wouldn't have people flocking into the, the capital. And then, therefore, that would uh, help reduce the rural-urban divide. Same applies for Karnataka. States recording very low multidimensional poverty index, like Kerala, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, seem to be allocating less than 9% of their GDP to development growth. The converse also holds true. States with high multidimensional poverty, like Chhattisgarh, Assam, Odisha, Bihar, Jharkhand, etc., seem to be earmarking higher proportions of their GSDP towards development. While state budgets witnessed accretion in development expenditure, a consequential proportion of it is spent in interest payments and loan repayment. In the backdrop of Sri Lanka's financial crisis, these states should carefully reassess their state budgets for fiscal risks as it could prove untenable in the long run. A common cause of worry that appeared across the states were fiscal risks, post, uh, fiscal risks associated with unsustainable debts, high income inequality despite net, dem net domestic product, reduced female participation in economic activities with increasing urbanization. So you see that a higher rate of women are participating in the economy in a rural area as opposed to urban areas. And this was seen across. Another very disturbing finding was an increased rate of unemployment among the educated and skilled sections of the society. With an increase in education, you see a higher rate of unemployment. With that, I'll move on to the political justice. The conceptualization of political justice heavily relies on the concept of rule of law. The prominent themes explored include looking at the efficient governance of the criminal justice system and the commitment of the states in realizing the federalist structures of democracy that is mandated by the constitution through the 73rd and 74th amendment acts. The legitimacy of a state comes into question when it fails to wield authoritative and autonomous control over violence. In modern society, that autonomy translates to re the responsibility of maintaining law and order in the state. 
and, a, and assuring a sense of security to its citizens. The analysis of criminal justice system was undertaken through three indicators, which is police efficiency. We looked at how efficient the police were in generating evidence for a case. How, what proportions of the case were dismissed because there was no evidence, but it was true. And NCRB offers this data as is. The second indicator was under trial population in prisons. Now prison overcrowding you must have heard about is a very important uh, issue. These under trial population in prisons, we saw reports which showed that a lot of these police officers do not know who gets to get a bail and who doesn't. And because of it, there is a lot of overcrowding in prisons. And the third indicator is the rate of crime per lakh population as provided by the National Crime Records Bureau. These are the ranks across the small and large states. The commitment to decentralization, the small states seem to be struggling with. In most of the large states, you see that urban devolution has happened to a higher extent when compared to rural devolution. But in states like Arunachal Pradesh and Sikkim, there seems to be higher devolution in rural areas as compared to urban areas. Because when it is easier to devolve urban functions, it seems it, it's, it's interesting to know that the opposite is happening in these states. The top performer in the small states category is Uttarakhand. I'm not sure if this quote is legible, but this quote tallies with Punjab, which ranks ninth among the large states. You see how far below the large states the small states seem to fare. And on the whole, the range of scores, the difference between the best performer in political justice and the worst performer in political justice is not a huge gap. This says that even though there is you know, a best state and a worst state, on the whole, all states seem to be facing some issue in addressing political justice that we've conceptualized. This is an indication that the best performer is not substantially better off than the worst performer. Moving on to social justice. Social protection and welfare occupy a prime sense of primacy in the discourse of justice. The critically and controversially debated 42nd Amendment Act incorporates the word socialist to the preamble of the Constitution. Probably an indication of how important it is. Amartya Sen's capability approach guides our conceptualization of social justice. That is, that every individual should have the freedom to achieve the well-being. And on the this is evaluated on the basis of their cap capabilities and functionings of the individual. For example, development is not whether I have food, I have shelter, and if I, it's not only that. It is also that if I want to fly a plane, I have the freedom, the economic freedom and the sensibility to fly a plane. And that is how Amartya Sen defines capability. PI 2022 conceptualizes social justice in the context of human development and the governance of commons through these two sub themes. The securing social order for promotion of welfare and control of material resources. Control of material resources looks at sanitation, drinking water, access to clean cooking fuel, uninterrupted power supply, and the trades and logistics ecosystems of the state. And securing social order for promotion of welfare is analyzed through four different indicators, premature mortality, early childhood development outcomes, learning achievements, and land degradation. Now, Punjab and Haryana have made great stri strides in terms of health and education, particularly education. In the National Achievement Survey of 2017, Punjab and Haryana were some of the worst performing states. And in the National Achievement Survey that assesses learning outcomes that was released in 2020, they are the best two states. States like Tamil Nadu ha seems to have declined in performance at the same time. Punjab and Haryana show very similar areas of good performance. For example, access to sanitation, drinking water, clean cooking fuel, uninterrupted power supply, and the trade and logistics ecosystem. Closely followed by Punjab and Haryana is Kerala. Kerala has achieved great strides in limiting premature deaths, in providing early childhood development outcomes, and an access to sanitation. However, all these three states, Punjab, Haryana, and Kerala, experience high rates of unemployment. So if there is no steady source of income for the people in the state, it could mean that whatever the strides they've made in improving the human development could be at risk because of its unsustainability. 
Among small states, Uttarakhand, Himachal Pradesh, and Sikkim occupy the top three ranks. Goa is closely following behind at the fourth position. However, the rate of land degradation in the state seems to be causing an issue. While we thought it could be because of the topography of the state itself, it says that the highest contribution to land degradation in Goa is vegetable degradation, which is again a matter that requires attention. An analysis of malnutrition progress made by states were compared with the National Family and Health Survey Round 4 and Round 5. We see that several states, even champions like Kerala, seems to record an increase in the rate of stunting, wasting, and underweight among children under the age of five. Haryana, Punjab, and Tamil Nadu seem to have overtaken Kerala in the percentage of in reducing the number of children who are wasted. Among small states, it's even more alarming. Seven out of the 10 small states show a decline in at least one type of malnutrition, either stunting, wasting, or underweight. A grim trend of unsustainability seems to lace growth in parameters of human development across several states. Findings from PI should act as a call for action to states to consider a serious reorientation of their policy towards improving human development. A program evaluation for schemes aimed to improve nutrition and learning outcomes seem to be the need of the hour. With that, we conclude the thematic insights to PI 2022. I would now like to introduce another innovative endeavor pursued by the Public Affairs Index 2022 team. As an addendum to the quantitative exercise, we've also initiated an in inquiry into the citizen centricity of the states. This element that provides a qualitative flavor to Public Affairs Index 2022 was conceptualized and driven by my colleague and team member Nidhi, closely supported by Ramana, who led the efforts to research and develop the methodology used for the analysis. Nidhi will now be providing brief insights into the emergent narratives of justice. Thank you, Anjana, for your very eloquent presentation on the central premise of PI. Like Anjana mentioned, PI undergoes periodic systematic reviews, and this time we try to add a qualitative flavor to the findings. In a democracy, citizen preferences are at least in principle reinforced by regular elections. Why then do policies fail? We think that it is because of the local context and how, how policies apply to a very non-linear demographic and geography. Policies and politics are afflicted by a certain unpredictability in the public eye. Their reception is very contextual. This is especially true of a country as diverse as India. Pi 22 therefore took upon itself the challenge of quantifying or at least analyzing in a systematic way all of these narratives and all of these local contexts that socially construct policies and politics. Gaining currency across research methods, narrative policy framework is a novel theoretical methodology premised on the very lifeblood of politics, narratives. PI 2022, ladies and gentlemen, mobilizes the same to supplement the rankings with citizens' voices from across the states. We move next to the empirical application of this very qualitative uh, exercise. Foremost in this application was to determine a suitable forum from where we could extract narratives. And this forum was identified as Twitter. Geotag tweets were mined and uh, they were uh, siloed for Pi 22's 28 large and small states. Using tweets, tweets are posts or messages on uh, the platform Twitter. Using tweets as proxies for the pulse of social construction of policy objects, emergent public sentiment was categorized as negative or positive. This sentiment was selected on the basis of a thorough literature review. The, the policy objects for the sentiment analysis were dependent on a thorough literature review and what made news and what generated polarizing opinions. Importantly, these objects speak to the framework elucidated by Anjana in her presentation of Public Affairs Index 2022. It treads on the same framework of three themes and five sub-themes. I would actually like to digress from the established protocol of presenting the methodology before the findings, and I think it would aid a fuller appreciation of the exercise. So we move on first to the findings. All all that you need to know as the audience is that it is a highly qualitative exercise 
and it is indicative in its sum and substance. That is to say, it is not statistically representative. And since it is very elaborate and comprehensive in its nature, for the sake of the presentation, it has been uh, subjected to some sort of uh, oversimplification. With this in mind, we move to the findings. Pertaining to narratives of economic justice, we looked at budget, fuel, agriculture, and employment. I'm sure this text is not legible, but if you look at the barometric visualization from red to green, red represents negative and green represents positive. Very interesting findings emerged. And these findings would actually find resonance in public parlance, common parlance. For budgets, for example, people in Uttarakhand appeared very negative. Users in Uttarakhand appeared very negative. On further prodding, however, it was not on account of the state government's budget that the people were negative. It was on account of the union budget 2022-23. To quote, one user summarizing a lot of other opinions which had been expressed in the state. One user claimed the budget is anti-people, anti-farmers, anti-youth and pro-corporate. On the other hand, states like Rajasthan recorded very positive views. What worked for Rajasthan? One said that it's the Krishi farm budget and lauded it as agricultural revolution and also lauded the state's efforts in recognizing the Annadatas. Fuel, for example, had similar polarizing opinions. People in Uttarakhand wanted a nationalized pricing for fuel and were very, uh, uh, very critical of the fact that there was a differential uh, pricing policy across states. On the other hand, in Karnataka, uh, there was discourse surrounding a purported accommodation of farm loan waiver that hiked the petrol and diesel prices. Madhya Pradesh, on the other hand, was largely positive in that it celebrated little breaks in the hike of fuel. In terms of employment, as you can see on the third uh, image, Manipur and Kerala appear to bear a negative uh, burden of opinion. In Manipur, uh, it was because of the demand for jobs that was not being met. In Kerala, it, it was a similar uh, it was a similar thought, but it was also uh, 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 hyphenated by uh, opinions which, which indicated a politicization and communalization of uh, employment in that people said that jobs were reserved for those who had contacts and money. The accolades of Goa in this scheme were appreciated and uh, employment avenues, very innovative employment avenues such as jobs in mining were identified. In agriculture, intuitively, Karnataka, Karnataka is on the negative end of, of the spectrum, and a lot of the uh, uh, many from the audience would recognize that farmer suicides dominate the discourse in terms of uh, generating negative sentiment in the state, and this emerged from our findings. Similarly, for political justice, in capturing how the public perceives the preambular spirit of the constitution in uh, perceiving po political justice, we looked at elections and law and order. The very foundation of a democracy is fair and fair elections, uh, fair and free elections. So we looked at elections and law and order. In terms of elections, intuitively, West Bengal, uh, West Bengal and its elections were highly criticized not only in that state, but across the country. People called it spine chilling violence in accounts of post poll violence. Goa, for example, was appreciated for having accessible elections in that they made it disabled friendly, old age friendly, and uh, district officers were lauded for these efforts. In terms of law and order, Kerala and Tamil Nadu had largely negative opinion. Most of it emanated from custodial torture, accounts of custodial torture, very localized, but they were there. And in Kerala, it was, again, communalization of uh, the police in how they dealt with the Shabrimala case and how they dealt with the local uh, feud between two factions in a church. In Meghalaya, it was poor traffic management that became central to the woes of the people. We move next to social justice and how it is to secure uh, to the people of India um, one of the highest human values. We look at controlling material resources and promoting welfare as envisaged in Pi 22. 
We look at electricity, roads, education, and vaccination. The latter two are in the context of COVID-19. In terms of electricity, Assam, Bihar, and Haryana had some of the highest proportions of tweets of negative intonation. Some of the common complaints were irregularity in billing and uh, uh, corruption, power outages, failures relating to e-payment systems. One uh, account in Bihar held that uh, frequent electricity cuts in our village due to rainy season, but heartless administration does not acknowledge students' difficulties. This also intersects with uh, with developments during COVID-19 and how they intersected with already uh, uh, with already uh, uh, poor pockets of uh, places where uh, there were power outages. In Nagaland, on the other hand, people were cele ce celebrating uh, electrification and uh, just rejoicing wherever there was a new village that was getting electricity. In terms of roads, Jharkhand and Bihar bore a very negative uh, burden of public opinion. And it was mostly because of uh, traffic personnel accepting bribes and potholes relating uh, causing accidents. Goa, again, uh, was creative in uh, dealing with these woes and customized posters and uh, had road safety campaigns to deal with these issues. Now, in terms of education and vaccination in light of COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic caught health systems the world off guard with its sudden emergence in 2020. Narratives surrounding vaccination were noticeably critical, actually, of the central government more than the state governments. However, in Sikkim, users quizzed the practicality of having a lockdown with restrictions on transport while simultaneously holding vaccination drives as people would not be able to make it to their camps. In Maharashtra, users berated preferential treatment at vaccination camps to blue tick uh, uh, Twitter users and complained of misappro uh, misappropriation of vaccines by some politicians. In Manipur, on the other hand, users lauded the efforts of the local government in uh, having vaccine uh, in their vaccination delivery efforts supported by drones. Some tweets in Manipur also sought to dispel vaccine hesitancy, dissuading locals from giving into false rumors. In the vaccination drive, when the pandemic forced school closures and triggered learning losses, states were coaxed into innovating interventions to tide over the disruptions. Netizens in Meghalaya tweeted a litany of protestations against the move to online education. Online education generated a lot of polarizing views in itself, invoking digital divide. Telangana appeared of, to, uh, to feature prominently in the spectrum of dissenting voices against the National Education Policy 2020. Tweets in Karnataka lambasted the conduct of exams by a collegiate public state university amid COVID-19 concerns. Users in Arunachal Pradesh, on the other hand, lauded the efforts of the government, district administrations, and civil society volunteers in ensuring the continu continuity of education during the pandemic. While at the surface, the exercise was an analysis of tweets, at the subsurface, there was a lot of trial and error. At the outset, we deal with the question, why Twitter? We use Twitter because they make their posts public. To get these tweets in a palatable, usable form, they were extracted alongside their metadata, chief among them the geocode or the geotags. The geolocation formed the basis for a state-wise analysis that we just presented. What we embedded this exercise in was sentiment analysis. As the name suggests, sentiment analysis assigns a sentiment, be it positive or negative. In our case, we were looking at a five-point refinement between strong positive and strong negative. This objective in Pi22's case was achieved through a combination of results from two machine learning algorithms. One is VADA and one is Recurrent Neural Network. Without getting into the specifics, which I'm sure my colleague uh, Ramana would uh, be able to dwell on better, we used VADA, which is Valence Aware Dictionary and Sentiment Reasoner, to assign score, scores of sentiments between minus one and plus one. In layman terms, uh, Vader works like an urban dictionary of sorts where each word has an assigned meaning, uh, has an assigned uh, sentiment. This was supplemented by a recurrent neural network algorithm which functions very similar to how the human brain functions. And they mimicking the, mimicking the structure of human neurons, recurrent neural networks also learn from other data points. In our case, the Stanford Tree Bank data set. Thus were sentiment classes assigned between positive and negative. 
Finally, all of these were coherently clustered using the hierarchical density-based spatial clustering of applications with noise, what is called as HDB scan. These methods shaped the analysis and gave, uh, and gave way to the prominent narratives from the huge corpus of tweets averaging about one lakh per topic identified. As with any other study, this exercise has limitations which I indicated earlier. Key among those caveats is the use or usage of digital, digital media, what we, know, what we can also perceive as digital divide. In terms of the rural-urban divide, according to the Telecom Regularity Authority of India, there were 37 internet subscribers per 100 rural population vis-a-vis -vis near, uh, near universal coverage in urban areas. This manifests in a very stark rural-urban divide. In terms of interstate disparities, there are states such as Chhattisgarh, which have uh, an internet subscriber base of, of seven, uh, single digit per 100 population. And then there are states like Andhra Pradesh, we are which are staring at near universal uh, internet su subscriber base. And these factors would positively or uh, negatively affect uh, the corpus of tweets that we extracted. Succeeding these considerations is the matter of internet usage, which is highly gendered, uh, as NFHS also attests to. Uh, females are uh, 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 around 33% females uh, 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 attested to ever using the internet in NFHS 5, against 57% in the case of men. Then there's also the matter of popularity of Twitter, which is intuitively more uh, popular among the younger cohorts. According to informal estimates, about 55% of those using Twitter are between the age of 18 to 34 years. The Pi team therefore acknowledges all these caveats and alerts to the reader and you, the audience, of a possible limitation. Also, as a word of caution, there were considerations relating to the algorithmic fitness, which stems from the very localized uh, use of language, the use of vernacular, and the use of Hinglish, uh, and how they would actually stump all of these algorithms which are Western-made. For those who are in Bangalore, we know that it is not a praise and it is not, uh, it is not a criticism for Meghalaya. With all these caveats, we are certain, however, the merit of the exercise in paving ways to systematically dissect the emotional balance and the climate of opinion across states. These analytics have also found resonance with published data points. For example, users in Bihar and Jharkhand shared their road woes of potholes, bribes, poor traffic management, and consequent accidents. These states have the second and fourth highest severity of road accidents as recorded by the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways in 2020. Discourse in Kerala similarly criticized the state's failure in alleviating unemployment distress and in managing the demand for jobs. Although the state performs well across the board in Pi-22, employment is a pain point for the state, with a high unemployment rate of 11.6% uh, within the age group of 50, 15 to 59 years. Pi-22 therefore recognizes the kaleidoscopic range of meaning-making that policy objects are subjected to and humbly submits this exercise as an addendum to analyze the quality of governance across states. With this, I invite my colleague Anjana to summarize the substance of Pi-22. Thank you, Nidhi, for being the voice of the public today. When I started by saying that I wondered how am I going to do it in 20 minutes, what I probably meant was that I'm going to take 30 minutes, but not so much more. Another interesting analysis that we undertook in Pi is the time delta analysis. Since the, there's been a substantial change in the model from the previous year to this year, it makes it difficult to compare. We cannot compare it between the two years. So we've tried to do an analysis of how the states fare vis-a-vis -vis themselves from the past three years or five years. However, in interest of uh, time and to not disclose the final ranks, I wouldn't be able to present the findings. Please try and read the report. I would urge you all to buy one and read them. Uh, to conclude, the accolades and debacles in the rankings apart, the states across India stare at a common fin finishing line. And to us, it is the directive principles of state policy. While PI 2022 wastes the statistical distance of state governments from realizing their constitutional mandates, the non-transactional realization of the constitution is the ultimate yardstick in a democracy. To this end, the directive principles are where our democratic sensibilities conclusively lie, forming the bedrock of justice. 
while Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, in the last speech at the Constituent Assembly debate, was filled with protuberance and warning, it was also deeply drenched in hope. Today, with that, that same sense of hope, I very humbly present to you the Public Affairs Index 2022, not as an epilogue, but as a data-driven beacon to improving governance in the states of India. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nidhi and uh, Anjana, for this expressive presentation, attesting to the methodological rigor and conceptual ingenuity of PI 2022. Thank you once again. I think they deserve a round of applause. So without further ado, I would like to invite once again the chairman, Dr. Ravindra, Mr. Sudish Pai, the chief guest, Mr. Guru the director of PAC, to please come on stage to release the Public Affairs Index 2022. Now for the much awaited announcement of winners, I request Mr. Guru Charan to kindly disclose the state's best strength in governance. I would also like to call on Dr. E. Ravindra and Mr. Pai to kindly honor the winners with a token of their achievement and a copy of the Public Affairs Index 2022. So the findings from the Public Affairs Index 2022, the best governed state in the large states category is Haryana. And the best government in the small states category is Sikkim. Congratulations to the winning states. And thank you, Dr. E. Ravindra and Mr. Pai for giving away the awards and to, Dr., uh, to Mr. Guru Charan for disclosing the uh, winners. I'm sure the winning and non-winning states alike have a lot to be proud of. I also take this opportunity to inform you that you can collect your copy from the counters outside. Uh, please avail your copy today. I now request Mr. Sudish Pai to deliver the keynote address on locating constitutionalism in everyday state and governance in India. Good evening, distinguished guests on and off the days, and particularly some veteran model civil servants whose very presence here this evening enthuses us. Destiny has kindly added years to their lives. They have wisely added life to their years. I'm deeply sensible of the honor of this invitation to be here this evening at the release of the Public Affairs Index 2022, which as we have all seen, has been a very rigorous and profound exercise for which I think as responsible citizens, we should all be indebted to the Public Affairs Center. The aspiration to make power and its exercise accountable has been the motivation for constitutions and constitutionalism. Constitutionalism is essentially an attempt to establish the supremacy of law. Men throughout history have longed for a higher standard by which their own man-made laws are tested. Constitutions are that higher standard. The belief that individuals have natural rights, inherent and inalienable, which are anterior to any written instrument like a constitution, that governments acquire authority from the people, that the purpose of government is to promote the common good, is what conceives and conceptualizes a constitution made in the name of the people, defining the parts of the main institutions and delineating the relationship between various organs of government and between the government and the citizens. It is framed for ages to come and designed to approach immortality as much as human institutions can. 
The advent of democracy and limited government heralded the concept of state and transformed the status of the governed to the citizens. Civilizations involve the subjection of force to reason. The agency of that subjection is the law. Law, and even more, constitutional law, is the means of ordering the life of a nation and the relations between man and man and man and state. <coughs> Constitution refers to a document like the Constitution of India, the Constitution of the United States. While constitutional law refers to the justiciable parts of the document, those rules that have been evolved by the courts in enforcing those justiciable parts, conventions and customs are all part of constitutional law. A constitution, as we all know, is the very life breath of a nation and the vehicle for its progress. It is the country's supreme law. Very broadly speaking, it's about division, distribution and management of state power so as to avoid arbitrariness and establish accountability to law. It's a framework of political society organized through and by law in which law has established permanent institutions with recognized functions and defined powers. A constitutional state, of course we all have states, but a constitutional state is one in which the powers of the government, the rights of the governed, and the relations between them are adjusted. The term constitutional government is applied only to those governments whose fundamental rules or maxims not only locate the sovereign power in some persons or bodies chosen in some prescribed manner, but also define the limits of its exercise so as to protect individual rights and shield them against the exercise of arbitrary power. All states purport to have constitutions, even Soviet Russia, the Republic of China, the so-called communist states also have constitutions and purport to govern people for their welfare. But what distinguishes the democratic state from a totalitarian one is that a free democratic state respects basic human rights and endeavors to achieve its objectives through the medium of fundamental freedoms. That is what constitutional government really signifies. The mere existence of a constitution by itself does not mean much and would not ensure constitutionalism or constitutional culture. Constitutionalism is essentially limited government of enumerated powers under a fundamental law. It signifies that the exercise of power should be controlled to ensure that it does not destroy the very values for which it was set up. It emphasizes that institutional arrangements must provide for effective control of the abuse of power. Absolute power is avoided by diffusion of authority, which introduces checks and balances in the system. A politically neutral civil service, an independent police force, an independent academic and practicing legal profession, a free press reflecting diverse points of view, and of course, an independent judiciary are considered essential concomitants of constitutionalism. A constitutional democracy is one where the majority will and rule are controlled and directed by principles of the constitution. And the successful working of a constitutional democracy depends not upon mere allegiance to the words of the constitution, the pro constitutional provisions alone, but imbibing a constitutional culture. This cannot be inherited in the bloodstream. It is to be cherished and nourished from generation to generation. It underlines the need to preserve people's faith in constitutional institutions and institutional safeguards. The aim of good government being to bring about the security, welfare, and happiness of the people. And of the different forms of government devised by man, 
democratic government with a bill of rights comes closest to the ideal. The constitution being the supreme law, no organ or institution has unfettered powers. All derive their powers from the constitution and have to function within those limits. In a constitutional democracy wedded to the rule of law, what prevails is constitutional supremacy. There is no organ, no wing, no institution is supreme. All have powers derived from the constitution to which they must adhere. It is the constitution alone that is supreme. And in countries like ours with a written constitution and an entrenched bill of rights, what prevails is constitutional supremacy. The structure of government is so designed that each branch is a sentinel on the Kwai Wai way against the other two, lest they become too powerful or autocratic. At least this is the theory. How far it really translates into practice is another issue, but on the whole, I think we can be proud of our achievements. Rule of law is the subordination or subservience of the executive to the legislative will that every executive action must be backed by legislative support. Under rule of law, law is preeminent and a check against abuse of power. While under rule by law, law can serve as an instrument of governmental oppression. And rule of law does not content, it se content itself with ensuring legality. It goes further to speculate on the limits of the extent of powers that governments can have. Question is not just what legal authority government has for what it seeks to do. More significantly, it is what legal powers ought government to have. Because as Lord Acton said, what is important is not what you prescribe, but what you can prescribe, for no prescription is valid against the conscience of mankind. The rule of law permeates the entire constitution which is meant to impart a momentum to the living spirit that democracy and liberty may survive in India beyond our own times. But in countries like ours with a written constitution, even the legislature is subordinate to constitutional rights, values, and limitations. And that brings in the concept of the reign of law. The legislative power too being subject to constitutional limitations. And therefore, we have in India not only the rule of law, but also what is called the absolute reign of law. <clears throat> a written constitution with Bill of Rights seeks to place certain human rights and fundamental freedoms beyond the reach of ordinary laws, because these rights do not depend on the whims of an immoral majority or the outcome of any election. And this is particularly so as regards the most precious rights to life and freedom, life and liberty. Such rights are not the gift of the constitution. They are not conferred by the constitution. As Professor Edward Corwin said, they owe nothing to the constitution. The recognition instruments like bills of rights and constitutions respond to recognizing these fundamental rights and such recognition is necessary if a constitution is to be complete. These fundamental rights are innate and inalienable because they are grounded in the very nature of man. It is a material what they are called. And when human rights are incorporated into the municipal law and guaranteed by a written constitution, they are generally called fundamental rights and are justiciable. The largest experiment ever undertaken in human history in the art of democratic living and governance has been carried on in India since 1950. Never before and nowhere else has about one sixth of the human race lived as one political entity under conditions of freedom. I think this is something which we as Indians can and ought to be really proud of in spite of whatever drawbacks, whatever problems we may face. And remember, we are like an oasis 
in the surrounding desert. None of our neighbors has democracy. None of our neighbors has a justiciable constitution. In none of our neighboring countries are people really free. We have our problems, no doubt about that, but still we are really something to be proud of. The Constitution represents a charter of power granted by liberty, not a charter of liberty granted by power. Because apart from providing a broad framework of government, it endeavors to protect liberties and secure justice. That's the constitutional vision and the goal. <clears throat> the Constitution seeks to provide for stability without stagnation and for growth without destruction of essential values. A majority of the provisions are aimed at furthering the goals of the social revolution to which we committed ourselves during the struggle for independence and at the framing of the constitution. The core of this commitment lies in parts three and four, the fundamental rights and directive principles, which together with fundamental duties, because no one can speak of a right without doing his own duty, and the preamble, encapsulates the constitutional vision, which may be said to be the conscience of the constitution. The justice provisions in part four, the directive principles, though not justiciable, are declared fundamental to the governance of the country and underlie all human development. Democracy is not just a legal, constitutional or formal concept. It is as much a social idea. As Dr. Ambedkar said in the Constituent Assembly, social democracy means a way of life which recognizes liberty, equality, fraternity as the principles of life which form a trinity. To divorce one from the other is to defeat the very purpose of democracy. It's the confluence of these principles which leads to the securing of justice. In fact, John Rawls, the great political scientist says, justice is the first virtue of social institutions as truth is of the system of thoughts. Now civilization may be said to be the degree to which men are sensible to wrongdoing and endeavor to set it right. The hallmark of a society claiming to be civilized, it's its ability to do justice. A state is successful when people have the confidence and assurance that they are living in a just society under protection of law and an adequate legal system. The function of the judiciary is to act as a civilizing force in the body politic. Justice is what the index also speaks of, the preamble speaks of. In fact, that's the very first word Justice, social, economic, and political. I think that underlines the entire constitutional vision and all the provisions that go to make it work for us. Justice is a synthesis of liberty, equality, and fraternity, a common thread that runs through all these values and makes them parts of an integrated whole. It reconciles conflicts and contradictions. It's the final goal to which liberty, equality, and fraternity should conform. We thus see the fusion and intermingling of the preambular objectives and realize how important they are. When we speak of justice, we do not mean justice in an ideal sense. That is the attribute of the divine. We are talking at the human plane. We mean a regime an adjustment of relations, ordering of conduct, as will make the goods of existence, the means of satisfying human claims, to have and to do things go around as far as possible without friction and waste. Justice implies a harmonizing reconciliation of individual conduct with general welfare. Now, equality of opportunity is the soul of social justice, which is perhaps the most important foundational concept that supports the democratic polity. Wealth has a social mission and must find expression and fulfillment in human well-being. With a sensible balance of economic growth and advancement of the welfare of the people as a whole, that would be economic justice. 
and political justice is the healthy maintenance of the checks and balances in the constitutional scheme and the legitimacy of democratic institutions. The legitimacy of democratic institutions brings us to the idea of electoral reforms because a free and fair election is a sine qua non for a successful democracy. It also brings in the need for reforms of political parties because it is through political parties that we work our democracy. Of course, these are two topics that on which we could talk a lot separately, but I am just emphasizing the need and importance of these two. Without social justice, economic justice cannot be secured. And it's only when a citizenry has secured both social and economic justice that we can claim to deserve political justice. <clears throat> India is an indestructible union of states as the constitution describes it. The concept of federalism basically involves distribution of powers between the center of the federation and the federating units. Dr. Ambedkar moving the draft constitution explained the significance of the use of the expression union. India is not a federation of states, India is an indestructible union of states. Saying that the expression is deliberate, for though divided into different states for the convenience of administration, the country is one integral whole, its people, a single people living under a single imperium derived from a single source. The basic principle of federalism is that legislative and executive authority is partitioned by the constitution itself, not by any law made thereafter. And that, of course, we find in the constitution. And therefore, what we really have is a cooperative federation of states with a bias in favor of the union, which within reasonable limits is undoubtedly necessary, having regard to conditions prevailing in our country. It is axiomatic that the success and strength of a federal polity involving dual governments and division of powers depend upon the maximum cooperation and coordination between governments. That brings in the idea of cooperative federalism. Even in an orthodox system of federalism with sharp division of powers like the United States of America, almost for the last hundred years, it has been realized that what is necessary is cooperation and even they tend towards cooperative federalism. In India, it has always been recognized both by governments and by courts that the purposes of both union and states would be best served in the national interest of the union and the states, both legislatively and administratively work in cooperation. The constitutional reforms heralded by the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendments relating to rural and urban local bodies have potential for what we may call a three-tier federation, not just the union in the states, the union states and the local bodies. Because this is the ideal which the constitution amendment envisaged. They point to changes in the political institutions in India, emerging as a pattern towards multi-level federalism or what is called an idea of federation of federations. You have even state finance commissions to review the financial position of local bodies. The idea is, for a village panchayat to be a unit of self-government, to promote social justice and economic development. This is devolution of powers and decentralization of government so that local bodies are not just executing agencies. This is a powerful tool of social engineering. However, it is important that these provisions are sincerely implemented and meaningfully worked. Federal governments are not the offspring of political science, but the product of socio-economic forces. And federalism is just another idea like any other idea in government. It is, we must note, an evolving concept, not frozen in time or content. Now, realizing the constitutional vision of justice is what really good governance is. The consummation of the constitution would be reached when justice reaches out to everyone, everywhere, as mandated by the constitution. Our nation state 
has been striving to entrench the constitutional vision of justice and achieve the constitutional goals. Public Affairs Index seeks to objectively and rigorously assess performance of governments in endeavoring to provide good governance and make the constitutional vision of justice a reality. It's my sincere hope that in the years to come, the Public Affairs Center will assess not only the performance of state governments, very important it, though it is, but also the performance of the union government. Constitutionalism facilitates a democratic political system by creating an orderly framework in which decisions are made. A cultivated respect for law and enduring institutions is absolutely important. An unfailing index to the maturity of a democracy is the degree of respect for unwritten conventions. What is unsaid in a constitution is as important as what is said. And constitutional equilibrium may be preserved when we can enforce obedience to the unenforceable. The realization of all this depends upon the recognition that constitutional morality is no less significant and necessary than constitutional legality. And the people at large have a significant role in this exercise because the highest office in a democracy, as Justice Frank Furter reminded us, is that of the citizen. Debate and dissent are the heartbeats of democracy, the right to protest, however, entails the duty to listen to other voices and shun rigidity or intolerance. Governments, too, have to be responsible and responsive. Law must reflect the general will of the people, which has evolved as a consensus through informed debates and discussion. And the most effectual means of preventing perversion of power and preserving the democratic republic is to illuminate the minds of the people at large. I think this is the greatest duty of any responsible government. And this is of utmost need and importance today. There are dangers that a constitutional state and the people have always to be on the guard. It is necessary to build, nurture, and cherish a culture of constitutionalism which is not merely regarding adherence to the form and letter, but a commitment to the substance, which is respect for and adherence to the rule of law, which, as someone said, is the tribute paid by power to reason. You have to discipline the exercise of power. That indeed is constitutional morality. Constitution, when we say constitutional morality, it is not that the moral content of any law can be judged by the courts. The moral content of a law has always to be, the final voice has to be with the people and the people's representatives. By constitutional morality, the great international lawyer Grote spoke of it, Dr. Ambedkar spoke of it, by Palkiwala spoke of it, by constitutional morality, Dicey spoke of it, by constitutional morality, what we mean is an adherence to constitutional principles and conventions, not just the letter of the law. And in realizing this, there is always to be an unremitting endeavor. Constitutions, it is said, may be easily copied, temperaments are not. And therefore, constitutional values and aspirations have to be internalized in the psyche of the nation. We need to develop and always have a decorous regard for and play by the rules of the constitutional game. Thank you so much for your patience and courtesy. I'm indeed thankful. Thank you, Mr. Pai, for your truly enthralling speech and equally riveting oration. It is befitting of the tone of the evening. We are grateful to Mr. Pai for courteously accepting our invitation to preside over the event. I invite Mr. Guru Charan, Director PAC, to offer a humble token of our appreciation to Mr. Pai. I now invite Dr. A. Ravindra to deliver the Chairman's address. Uh, Mr. Sudish Pai, Mr. Gursharan, and uh, 
other senior citizens and young friends. Well, after listening to the eloquent speech of Mr. Sudish Bhai on the <coughs> constitution and its principles, both theoretical principles and what should be done in practice, I think there is a very little for me to say. Nevertheless, uh, just a few words. In the first place, let me congratulate all those who participated. Keep it? OK, OK. Oh, you shouldn't, uh, shouldn't touch a matter. All right. All the states who participated in this uh, PI effort, and of course the winners, I find Haryana among large states and Sikkim among the smaller states have been the winners this time. I think a pleasant departure from what was happening the previous years. I used to find it was mainly Kerala number one and Tamil Nadu number two and say most of the southern states dominating. So it's, it's good, I mean, uh, that's that way. Uh, let me congratulate them once again. I would also like to congratulate our uh, director, Mr. Gursharan, and his team, particularly, I think, Nidhi and uh, Anjan, who have made the presentations. I think they worked very hard, and they deserve a round of applause. Well, so far as the theme of the Pi 2022 is concerned, much has already been said. For the first time, I find that, you know, we have made a departure again from the themes that we were dealing with in the previous years and focused our attention on the Constitution. I think very rightly so, and perhaps it's very timely if you look at what is really happening across the country. I think the constitutional principles must need to be uh, not only reiterated, but reasserted in a very firmer tone. Well, <clears throat> we, we heard a lot about justice, whether it is economic, social, political, and so on. And the core principles behind them, liberty, equality, fraternity. But I think the guiding principles for all these comes from the directive principles of state policy which in a way give, uh, narrate what exactly needs to be done if we are to become a welfare state. But rightly or wrongly, they are not enforceable in courts. In a way, it is good because I think the people also need to take some responsibility about you know, following the principles laid down in the Constitution and uh, trying to realize their goals. But the question is, in how far have we succeeded? It is one thing to talk about the glorious principles enshrined in the Constitution, which we keep, uh, you know, as I said, reiterating now and then. So this PI report gives an assessment of how different states have done and assigned different ranks. That is okay. But if you look at the overall performance in, bro in the broad constitutional goal of securing justice in different, uh, you know, sectors, In a federal democracy, I think uh, Mr. Pai expanded on that. When you speak about the constitution, the role of the center also becomes very important. And that, of course, I mean, because the mandate was not to include uh, an evaluation of the central you know, schemes and things like that. Uh, but we need to look at it in a total context because the center influences the states in several ways. Federalism, I think fiscal federalism was mentioned. It's not only fiscal, political, administrative. The, inter the relationship between center and the states. And we know nowadays here that there is more and more of centralization through various means. I'll not go into the details. I think you, you know all that. And also find that you know the political discourse has somewhat turned in uh, you know, a confrontational in a sense, you know, instead of in earlier, it used to be a little more refined in the earlier days. But now, 
even between the states and the center, if it is, especially the, if the, in the states, you find the parties are different, ruling parties are different. It is always a confrontation, whether it is West Bengal or Tamil Nadu or Kerala on one side. And Karnataka may be trying to wriggle <laughs> out in it. They don't know what to say. So silence is the you know best answer there. It's OK. I mean, all the people, people's voice is heard. I mean, you should not impose this, impose that, and so on and so forth. It is not only in the field of politics, I find, you know, this uh, the issues that have arisen in the recent past, even the judiciary is divided. If we look at the judgment on hijab, two judge bench. Well, at this point, let me <laughs> make Mr. Sudish Pai is here. I don't know why two bench, two judge benches are constituted. Because if two judges give different or dissenting opinions, there is no opinion. It has to go to the larger bench. And you know, it's referred to the larger bench or five or seven if it is constitutional. We never had two judge benches. It, it has to be three or five in more important cases. So that you do get a verdict, as in the case of Ayodhya, for instance. I mean, that is just uh, beside the point. Uh, I thought I'll just raise only one point because, uh, see, that is the discourse on Indian democracy. Of course, Ms. Sudish Pai rightly made the point that in spite of all the problems that we may have, as a democracy, India is a model of success. You know, we have survived given the diversity of our population, the, you know, the regional, the linguistic, religious, and we keep quarreling about them. But still, you know, we have survived as a democracy. And among the developing countries, it's certainly a shining example. If you look at what is happening in neighboring countries or even in the so-called civilized countries, I think we, we try to learn democracy or the democratic principles from highly advanced democratic countries like the United States and the United Kingdom. We adopted in the constitution parliamentary form of democracy is from UK and separation of powers from the US and so on. But today, I think we have a lesson or two to teach those two countries in particular. Let me refer to in the United States, what happened at the end of the Trump presidency? I mean, a political party, people going and storming the parliament, the Capitol, which is considered the sacred. I mean, I always used to look upon the Capitol building. Oh, what a wonderful place. Not only to look at, but even inside deliberations and all that. But you see, fortunately, such a thing has never happened in India. And today, you look at what is happening in the UK. Uh, they, they seem to have, there seems to be no leader or they don't know how to govern. And our governance is certainly better at the moment. And probably they tried to put an Indian, a person of Indian origin there, there again, <laughs> it failed. maybe someday it will happen. And then, and then people with Indian origin may be able to teach a lesson or two as to how to govern uh, democracy, an ancient democracy where, which originated Magna Carta and so on and so forth. There's no doubt about that. But uh, what I really wanted to draw your attention was, you know, so recently, I think, uh, you know, there's a ranking of countries on different things, you know, on developmental index, human development, economic growth, and so on and so forth. But some of these uh, global watchdog institutions, you know, they try to take on the task of assessing uh, the place of, I, I have democratic, it is a country. And they downgraded India, you know, <laughs> as, uh, in, in terms of uh, democracy and human rights or whatever it is. And uh, in order to rebut that, in the Ministry of External Affairs, there is a public policy and research uh, division. So they brought out a paper or a document called India as a Democracy. I will not go into the detail except to say, that it points to what is called the Indian way of democracy. And they've expanded on that, what is the Indian way and all that. Very briefly, it means they have said that India is a pluralistic society, number one. Two, intuitively an international society. And three, they have said, you know, we have always gone by 
it's our own ideal of what is called vasudeva kutumbakam that is <clears throat> we treat the whole world as one one family well this certainly grand principle here we should certainly be proud of our civilization of our culture that all these values that we have inherited <clears throat> but i think what is important is this you know they have also said about this uh, civilizational ethos so what is the civilizational ethos of india yeah talking about all these you know inherited virtues of vasudeva kutumbakam <clears throat> and things like that you know it is all very well but in practice what is happening as i said you know more polarization more confrontation and it is not that the majority of the people or appreciate it or a party to it no but it is the political parties and maybe a minority or very very microscopic minority of the uh, the negative elements in society this as, as they may be called they make use of this uh, occasion and, and therefore i think on this occasion especially after listening to mr pai i would say i think the civilizational discourse the political discourse needs to acquire a more positive tone and that is where maybe i don't know civil society has to play a, an important role when the leaders fail people have to act that is the lesson of democracy and it has happened in a number of countries it happened in the us and many other countries also i mean whether in european countries like france the french revolution and all that so in india also it has happened you know the movement the jp movement at a particular point of time and india against corruption so they just shook the governments in power so all this is required when you know power goes to the heads mr pai quoted lord acton and once said, lord acton also said power corrupts absolute power corrupts absolutely and that is perhaps what has happened in one sense and that has to be reversed and uh, as as i said quoting from uh, dr ambedkar the ambedkar himself was the chief architect of the constitution he said the success of the constitution does not depend on the nature of the constitution the words what is written etc it depends on how it works or it is worked so it where the people have also a very important role to play in one sense yes people of india have be, played a role i would say otherwise you know, we could not have survived as a democracy like this we have shown patience we have shown anger at times but i think the time is again come i think for a kind of as i said first of all to make corrections in the discourses whether it is on democracy or on civilization and uh, uh, there was a time when you know i think it was in the early 1990s or 1989 beyond that after the soviet russia collapsed francis fukuyama a great political scientist american he said this is the end of history he wrote a book saying that is the end of history which meant that it is the western style of democracy and market capitalism that will be the future that is that is going to be the successful model for all times but as i said even america itself has failed in that model in implementing that model successfully so i think in, t- today you know it is uh, very interesting and we should be proud of it that many countries in even the world looks upon india as a leader in international on the international stage and they are suggesting india should take the lead in trying to solve some disputes and problems including the uh, <coughs> russian ukraine war i mean it is, it, it is a great recognition of uh, the strength of indian democracy strength of indian leadership and so on so uh, let us derive inspiration from the good things that have happened and uh, i would again say i mean probably I conclude by saying what sudesh bhai made a reference to that in our assessment of the states is one thing but when you speak about constitution federalism etc the center comes into play maybe next year's pai report uh, should also bring in at least i would say the relations the center state relationships how it's worked how has federalism worked 
whether it is uh, federalism in the constitutional sense or cooperative federalism as we are speaking these days. The central government itself, <coughs> the prime minister spoke about cooperative federalism right in the beginning, seven years ago. But you know, how, how is it working? Is it cooperative or confrontationist? And what should really guide, what should be the guiding principles of say cooperative federalism? And uh, both, you know, there I think we need a more, it is a much more difficult exercise. It's not going to be easy and you need to evolve different criteria for that and uh, <coughs> you know things like that but certainly i am so i'm certainly sure that pac is capable of uh, doing that and uh, we hope there will be a more interesting uh, presentation and discussion uh, when we present the pi report 2023 uh, with these few words let me uh, thank the director and all the others and thank all of you for uh, responding to our invitation and uh, having, be, having shown the patience to listen to all that has been said. Uh, I also see some old faces. Sita is here from PAC. She was one of the first ones to join, and of course she left, and then I, we are very happy to see her. And as Ms. Gurusharan said, very senior uh, officers, you know, it is good to see. And we will certainly look to them for uh, more uh, guidance and advice on how to do better. PAC has a mandate of promoting good governance. And uh, we look forward to your own suggestions. As they say, and we speak about people's participation. So we would certainly like your participation in trying to make PAC a much, much better organization. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your thought-provoking uh, address. As the evening draws to a close, I am filled with a deep sense of gratitude towards all those who've helped bring almost a year's worth of work to its logical conclusion. At the outset, I would like to thank Mr. Pai for being with us this evening. I would like to thank Dr. Ravindra, Chairman of PSC, and all the board members here for extending their unequivocal and timely support. The team has benefited greatly from your counsel. I extend my sincere thanks to Mr. Guru Charan, Director PAC, for closely scrutinizing the conceptual engineering of PI 2022 as it stands today. The document is a fairly technical one and it prides itself on its scientific rigor. The team owes the same to Dr. Rituparna Sen, Associate Professor at Indian Statistical Institute, Bangalore. Your supervision and intellectual influence has been foundational to PI 2022. I also acknowledge the collective efforts of our colleagues at PAC for their unconditional support in the production of the document. The report and the event alike are fusions of such efforts. Finally, on behalf of the Public Affairs Center, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to you, distinguished members in the audience, dignitaries, and our friends from across think tanks and NGOs, and members of the media, for being patient, receptive listeners, and for celebrating Azadi Ka Amrut Mahutsav with Public Affairs Index 2022. Thank you, and good night.